Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. And Art, I want you to meet our newest contributor to Celebrating Act Two, Act Two the man in the middle, John Mariani. Welcome, John. Well, hello, hello John. John. Good to be on. Good to be on. And nice to meet you, John. You too, Art. Now, Art, you've uh, you've seen John's newsletter, sure. The Virtual Gourmet, uh, world famous because of that. But also, he's been seen in uh, gosh, how many newsletters, uh, newspapers, John, and and uh, online news sites. Mm -hmm. It's been uh, it's been forty five years of grinding it out. <laughs> no, of eating your way across the world. Well, you know, people think I get paid to eat around the world and to stay in fancy hotels. That's only the research. I got to go back and bang out fifteen hundred, two thousand words that are readable, and and my editor does not say this is junk. So that's what I get paid for. Oh, okay. So you haven't figured out a way just to do research? Uh, no, <laughs> no, I haven't. So, John, it's interesting. Forty-five years. I happen to, uh, John and I went to high school together, Art. So I know John very well. Um, By the way, but just you uh, started to establish everybody. John, where are you located? Where do you live? I'm uh, outside of New York City in a small town called Tuckahoe, which is very close to where we went to high school in New Rochelle. New Rochelle, the hot spot of COVID nineteen. It is. Yeah. It is yeah. specifically Wikigil. Yeah. So listen, we'll talk about COVID-19 and uh, uh, Westchester and all of that. And another one I want to know, I want everybody to meet you and uh, kind of know where you come from. And and if they haven't seen your newsletter, I want them to understand what they're going to get when they subscribe. Free um, of charge. But, pardon? Free of charge. Free of charge, of course. Um, but they probably have seen your name. Um, on Bloomberg News or in Esquire, you, you have for was it twenty years? You did the thirty-five new, years. Yeah. Best new restaurants in America it was a cover story in Esquire annual cover story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Um, it was. It showed me so much about how things not only have changed, but about how Americans like to eat and how the cream really has risen to the top year after year after year for those thirty-five years back in when I started back in the 1980, uh, pickings were slim for really, really fine restaurants. And by fine, I don't mean grand fine dining necessarily, but really good food. Um, and a lot of that, if not most, had to do with a complete lack of availability of very good ingredients. I and mean, when you think back to 1980, the thought of getting fresh asparagus in season only, or not eating strawberries in January, only having <clears throat> one kind of mushroom, the white mushroom available, no prosciutto, no real parmigiano, no extra virgin olive oil. None of these things existed. And um, I saw the development of California cuisine and Nouvelle cuisine and the whole health movement and um, uh, Mediterranean diet. It's, it's been a great five decades. Fascinating because it really, uh, food is, is a huge part of our culture it's it's a part of our culture that people used to take for granted meaning that they'd read the wednesday food pages in newspapers mainly for recipes for casserole cookery <clears throat> which were put out by uh, uh, betty crocker and the big food companies and the newspaper food editors just kind of reprinted the stuff there were very few people at that time traveling the country and taking american food seriously um i would say maybe less than half a dozen who were doing what I was doing because nobody was funding it. Nobody took it seriously. But it took a big, big um, uh, turn for the good when we started to get really fine California wines when Alice Waters out there in California popped this strange question, why can't we have vegetables that taste the way they do in Europe? And the answer was because big business doesn't know how to do that. Big agro business. Um, all of these things were um, earth shattering uh, at a time when Americans are very complacent about their food. And then a lot of the people who came out of college, like myself, who never imagined 
writing about or opening restaurants or becoming a chef, which is very low rent uh, kind of profession. Um, suddenly you found these ex hippies who were running hipster kitchens in the late 1960s and the 1970s were opening up these really good restaurants, not least in California. And I'll give them a lot of credit too. People like Alice Waters, people like like uh, Mark Miller, and people like Jeremiah Towers, and people who became big names. Wolfgang Puck, who was from Austria originally, um, shook up the, the Los Angeles world with his gourmet pizzas and, and so forth. Um, food became glamorous, restaurants became sexy, um, and uh, the whole what what had been a modest food culture uh, grew to be extremely expensive. When I wrote my first uh, book, which was the Dictionary of American Food and Drink, and they, people said, oh, that's going to be thin. Well, it was 400 <laughs> pages, and the fifth edition is 600 pages, and uh, it goes from abalone to Zinfandel wine and everything in between. Uh, you've really seen uh, quite a change uh, over the years. What's, what's the uh, culture like now, food and food culture in America like now? Well, uh, food culture in America used to be wholly influenced by Europe, <clears throat> especially French cuisine and Italian food and Chinese American food, and all these slash American foods, Jewish American food, German American food. And now the opposite is true that if you go to Mumbai or you go to uh, Hong Kong, you will see iterations of American food and American food techniques, um, not just hamburgers. Um, and and, and uh, hot dogs. I don't mean that, and but they do have first-rate steakhouses. And they do have first-rate Italian restaurants using Italian American ideas, uh, Italian American and, and uh, California wines, New York State wines. We have much more influence in the rest of the world's gastronomy than they now have on ours. Fascinating, it, uh, and I guess that's partly why our economy is the biggest in the world. Oh, up until the last two weeks, absolutely, yes. Well, <laughs> I wasn't talking about the corona crisis, no. um, but generally speaking. Uh, well, you we always mentioned raise, always raise much more food than even we can eat. And, uh, you know, the government pays uh, the farmers to put corn in silos and s serve it to uh, livestock because we just have always been an abundance of food at very cheap prices. Americans don't realize what a quarter of milk costs in France or a, or a half a pound of, uh, of uh, uh, beef steak uh, costs in England. It's much more expensive over there. Not as expensive, not as inexpensive as it would be in Asia, where food is astoundingly cheap. But we are very, very lucky in this country because we have such abundance, always have. You mentioned uh, books. You've written a dozen books or more, haven't you? Uh, about 15 or so, yeah. Yeah, and how, ma how many of them were about food? I know you've written at least one novel. Uh, actually, four novels, but only one, uh, two have been published. So there's, there's some in the pipeline. Good. I hope they get published soon. Um, when you started, John, back in the, what, 70s? Mm-hmm. Is that about right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you were doing food. When did you bring travel into your repertoire? Well, first, starting in 1973, when I started to write for New York Magazine, um, I was writing about arts and entertainment. And oh. um, I was interviewing everybody from, from uh, Henry Fonda to Sylvester Stallone. And that was, that was terrific, too. What that engendered was I had to travel not only to see those people in Hollywood, but if they were shooting a movie in London, or I remember going to Malta, to uh, where they were shooting this uh, movie called Midnight Express. So I started to travel the world. I was kind of a hanger-on to uh, the uh, movie uh, production studios, which had journalists along, and I started to learn a little bit about, wow, the food over here in France and Italy is really terrific, and wow, these wines, I've never tasted anything like this. I've never seen seafood quite like this. So I was just developing my palate and then along about, I don't know, 74, 75, I just wrote a little article about a day in the life of an Italian restaurant in Greenwich Village, which a lot of people and editors liked. So I'd get a travel article uh, assignment or uh, write a little bit more about uh, some restaurants. So I became a restaurant reviewer for the New York Times and Q Magazine and others. And before I knew it, 
Um, I had not abandoned the arts and entertainment um, uh, uh, writing, but was doing much more food and travel writing than, uh, and that really exploded when I joined uh, Esquire in uh, the early 80s. Uh, I, John, I have a quick question for you. Uh, for all our viewers out there, if uh, they wanted to uh, buy your book or follow you, uh, can mm -hmm. you give us your website and uh, the best place for them to buy your books? Yeah, you could go to johnmariani.com. That's all, just johnmariani.com. And there you there will be a list of my books and photographs of them, which uh, I think some of them are linked to Amazon, those which are still in print. And um, you can get them that way. And uh, the same uh, the same johnmariani.com will also allow you to subscribe free of charge to my virtual gourmet newsletter, which is, as John says, has been going on for more than 20 years. Uh, thank you. So speak. Speaking of the newsletter, um, you have you're not a one man band. You have uh, four or five, maybe more contributors, including mm -hmm. some well known um, newsletter people or or writers themselves. Everett Potter uh, is part of your contributing staff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if staff is the right word. Um, not and a, he's not a staff, but uh, yeah, they're, <laughs> well, they're out, see they're out there like me. They're traveling and eating. I don't know how many offices. They don't. Nobody stays in their office. Uh, yeah, and Everett Potter is, correct me if I'm wrong, is he a, a golf guy, among other things? He's Does a he big golf and ski guy. And then Jerry Dawes, who is, I think, the greatest living exponent, uh, knows more about Spanish food and wine than anybody I know. Um, there's Brian Friedman, who's a terrific wine writer. Um, Jeff Kalish, who's a good good uh, friend and, and wine writer. So they're top-notch people. And... Um, yeah, you 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 get a really good staff. Plus, you brought your sons in. <laughs> they I occasionally them, write a, a certain, few articles. At a, at a certain point, a few years ago, when they were in, they're now in the restaurant industry, both of them. But before that, um, they did write for me because they were hanging around the house. And I said, "Why don't you go off on this trip? I can't go on." And uh, <laughs> they came back, and they they turned out to be very good writers. That's great, and I I can't uh, I can't talk about your newsletter without mentioning your top editor you are the editor in chief but your senior editor is walter bagley who spent 30 years at reuters i mean this is as an industry guy intramural yes yeah yes yeah. yeah. walter walter and i and you uh we go back uh to the 1960s and uh graduated in 1963 and uh walter lives less than two miles away and he graciously assented to um fix my weak prose <laughs> And speaking of prose, by the way, I, I've told you this before. I love your writing. Um, every time I read one of your newsletters, which is weekly, uh, I am either transported to another country or another city, or my mouth starts watering based on your description of the food. Right. I, I just, it, it's an easy read and it's a fun read. And it's a, in a way, because when you take me to, I don't know, Italy, a particular town or a region, you usually wrap in, within a couple of uh, newsletters, wrap in the culture, the wine, and the food, and yeah. sometimes the, the people, uh, uh, well, a lot I, of the chefs. I mean, you put your finger on what I really write about is food culture. Um, I don't write, uh, I do write about wine every single issue. But it's not just, uh, here are six wines I drank this week. This one has a high fruit and this is a low acid and tannin. I, I can't bear writing that stuff, even though I write, do uh, on occasion have to. Um, so if I go to Italy, yes, I'm going to tell you what's special about this section of Italy. What kind of food do they have based on the ingredients they have, um, the language, uh, how they tie it into their art and, and everything else. That's uh, true. And that's as true as if I'm going to Texas or, or Italy or Los Angeles. Remember when we dined out for that crazy two or three days together and uh, <laughs> we went to Wolfgang Puck's restaurant up in the um, I remember it Bel Air very Hotel well. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and when you dine, that brings up another point that most people are not aware of. When you go out to a restaurant, uh, you don't go alone. You're not the masked yeah. critic uh, disguised who comes back with a good review or a bad review that can break them and make them go out of business. You really uh, – you're upfront about who you are. You shake hands with everybody. The yeah. All the uh, restaurateurs and the chefs know you. Uh, 
-hmm. and you'd like to dine with other people. So, I mean, you're really reporting on a dining experience, not just the food. Well, exactly. There are two aspects to your, to your question, or your statement. Um, one is that, yeah, I am not a uh, consumer reporter, as a weekly restaurant critic might be. And that person attempts to go anonymously, which is always nonsense. Always nonsense. <laughs> Every restaurant in any city in America has on their refrigerator magnet wall the photographs, including my own, of the various critics that they have in their town. So nobody goes in anonymously. Um, aside from that, as I said, I really do. I want to talk to the chef. Oh, well, what are you doing with this kind of food? Describe your food to me. How did you get that texture when you were making that, that, that sauce? Um, now, the decor here. Uh, explain, t tell me about the decor. Where did, where, did, where did you find this? Did you have a design? Because that's what I'm trying to bring the reader to see and to discover, would you like this place? And what is it about it that would draw you if you just don't want to go in and order a salad or a piece of grilled salmon? So, um, I mean, they, these are personalities. Some chefs have enormous, big, expansive personalities like Jose Andres and, and, and Wolfgang Puck and, and others. And um, they are part of the story. Yeah. And a lot of them. Are, of course, there's a lot of big chains, famous chains mm -hmm. like Wolfgang Puck's uh, chain, but a lot of them are small family operations, yeah. uh, even in the U.S. And I think that's probably very true overseas, but in the U.S., there's still – you go to a lot of restaurants where, um, you know, it's two guys who had the dream of building a restaurant. Mm -hmm. It's uh, – it is – they are the small businesses – 99% uh, of them are small businesses. Now, it might be two people or a husband and wife, and given that they can't afford $5 million kitchens and 20 employees, you cannot imagine how hard these people work. A minimum of six days is what a working, what a work week is for a, a restaurant owner. And um, they really work, and they really have to love it. And um, they have to, I mean, as you, you read about mad chefs, um, squirrel, well, the Gordon Ramsay phenomenon, which is a phenomenon only because Gordon Ramsay plays that part of this despicable chef who is a perfectionist and, and yells at, at people when he doesn't even cook very much anymore himself. He just yells at people on TV. Uh, <laughs> that's not the way you run a kitchen. Um, someday we may do a segment on crazy chefs and, uh, and anecdotes about them. But, uh, no, these days, especially because of, uh, human resources and you could be brought up for brushing up against a female worker these days. <laughs> so, uh, you can't get away with what you used to get away with in the business. Uh, so John, John partner, John, uh, yes. you were right. John M is amazing. Okay. Yeah, been, uh, we, we've been, oh, I've been, I've been, yeah, Peshaw is right. A big Peshaw. Sure. And uh, <laughs> I'm delighted that you're going to be a regular contributor to Apple. our series. Thank you. And uh, in addition to all the other credits, uh, if you go to our website, celebratingact.com, celebratingact2.com, on the right where it says contributors, there'll be a link directly to your newsletter. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Uh, we're enjoying it ourselves, and we hope that they'll find that as a great link to go enjoy. And uh, look forward to seeing you uh, again. Any last words, John, partner John? Uh, no, just be sure to subscribe to John's newsletter because uh, uh, it is a lot of fun to read. It's weekly. It's free. It's in my email box every week. Um, and it's a trip. It's a trip to a great restaurant. It's a trip to a foreign country. It's a trip. It's just wonderful. Just wonderful. Uh, just, you know, remember that at our age, eating three times a day is the only thing we can do three times a day anymore. So, uh... <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Thank Thanks a lot, John. We'll see you soon. Okay. That's to you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.